So Takao Ozawa was born in Japan uh, in the late 1880s and came to the United States uh, and actually um, resided in Berkeley, California, went to Berkeley High School, uh, went to UC Berkeley, and eventually moved to Hawaii uh, and became a very successful businessman. And he wanted to, you know, and he was successful and he was really invested in becoming an American. He, it was really important for him to gain that recognition that he was contributing to American society in the same way that everyone around him uh, was doing, all, all his business friends. And so he challenged, he sort of made a case that, um, you know, because of all of his virtues and all of his hard work uh, and all of his accomplishments, that the court should recognize that and that should be considered as a merit uh, for American citizenship. Uh, well, this sort of went through the courts. He wrote his own brief. I mean, he's very articulate about sort of his, his position. And finally, you know, uh, in the early 19th century, uh, this was, I believe it was 1916, that uh, he finally sort of got his chance in front of the Supreme Court. And, um, and, and one of the compelling arguments in his brief is where he compared himself to Benedict Arnold. And so he said, you know, by name... General Benedict Arnold was an American, but in his heart, he was a traitor. And he said, uh, by name, I am not an American, but in my heart, I am a true American. And when I saw, you know, when I read that brief, uh, and I, I saw the documentary first, and then I went to read the actual full legal brief uh, that was uh, presented to the Supreme Court, um, I was really impacted by that because this was over a hundred years ago. This argument that this gentleman made that in his heart he was not, uh, he was American, but in name the government didn't recognize that. And that, to me, it echoed with the stories that I heard in the, you know, hundred interviews that we did uh, with undocumented students and the ethnographic work that we did uh, for uh, well over a year. Um, and even in the survey work uh, where we asked students about their identity and how uh, sort of they view themselves. That this notion that, that they were Americans by heart and that, you know, the, and that that should be recognized. Uh, was something that sort of just stuck with me and it sort of came up um, in when we were trying to come up with a title for the book. Um, but that's really sort of what's at the crux here of this issue, even today. You know, so even a hundred years later, long after Takao Ozawa, you know, uh, passed away and he was never able to, you know, when the law finally changed, uh, you know, he was, he had passed away. So all of the work that he did to eventually contribute to changing the law so that, you know, you didn't have to be white to become an American, the Japanese Americans and people from all over the world could earn the right to become a naturalized citizen, um, he was not able to see that. But that struggle continues today uh, with millions of undocumented young adults, um, children, uh, and families who live in this, uh, you know, sort of limbo, you know, who contribute in a variety of ways, who are role models and are model citizens uh, in terms of the civic activities, and yet, there's no place in the law where we can recognize those contributions, right? And so, uh, the struggle for, you know, it really is a, a civil rights issue, um, uh, ha is beginning to sort of reach uh, a significant momentum. Uh, and, you know, the things that, the conclusions that I reach based on the work that I've been doing for the past six years now, is that, you know, the reasons for passing legislation like the DREAM Act and comprehensive immigration reform um, from an empirical perspective are much more compelling than the reasons for not providing a path to legalization. I mean, that's one of the, the most significant conclusions. And I think something that, um, that particularly connects to here in California, you know, a, a, a big milestone on a national level that was accomplished by the state of California is, as many of you know, is the passage of the California Dream Act, which, as a complement 
to AB 540, which is a, a piece of legislation that allowed undocumented students who graduate from high schools here in California to pay in-state tuition, um, the California Dream Act complements that by allowing undocumented students to uh, be eligible for the financial aid resources that the state of California provides for its residents. Well, soon after the passage of that law, I was invited to speak to different media outlets and radio shows about it, and, and people would call in uh, or start writing or were, you know, Twitter a question. And something that came up consistently was, you know, these students are taking away resources from U.S. citizens, and that's not right. You know, that, that we're basically giving them something for free that they haven't earned uh, and that, in fact, uh, there are lawbreakers on top of that. I mean, that's, that's sort of the, the frame by which this issue is, is discussed on the national level. And it's a frame that, unfortunately, doesn't allow for a productive conversation because it sort of paints the issue as black or white. Right, as sort of being two-sided. And as an academic, and, and you know, those of you here who are academics and are, and are graduate students and undergrads know that you know, most issues aren't that simple. And to act and pretend that they are just creates more problems, which it has when it comes to immigration. So, you know, a response that, you know, that I think it's, it's so obvious to, to those of us who study this issue, but yet the general public oftentimes is not aware of it, is that Describing the California Dream Act as legislation that takes away resources from U.S. citizens and gives them to people who don't deserve it uh, is, is a gross mischaracterization of, of that issue. And, and the way that I sort of talk about it is this, is that in the state of California, you know, so the, the, the state allocates money towards higher education from all of the revenue that come in, right? And a big chunk of that revenue comes from real estate tax, comes from sales tax, comes from gasoline tax. Right? Those are sort of three of the, of the there are five main sources of, of revenue for the state of California. Those are three of the main five. Uh, the other two have to do with taxes to the corporate taxes and sort of other uh, corp um, sort of business tax. Um, and in those three main re revenue sources of the state of California, um, everyone contributes to that. So anyone who owns a home or rents a home, regardless of their legal status, contributes to that. Uh, anyone who owns a car or you know, rides public transportation, a portion of public transportation goes towards uh, the gasoline tax. Right? And sales tax, if you buy anything in the state of California, everyone who buys something, regardless of their legal status, contributes to the sales tax revenue. Right? And so that revenue then, a piece of that, 17% of that goes towards higher education. So the Cal State, the CSU, uh, the, the, the UC, and the community college system. So up until the California DREAM Act, Undocumented workers in the state of California have been contributing to the state budget through these main sources of revenue. But their children, once they graduated from high school, couldn't receive the same benefits that their neighbors received that were contributing equally to the state budget because the law uh, didn't allow for it. The California Dream Act protects that. Uh, or, or, or at least corrects that, uh, that process so that Undocumented parents um, and, and their children can benefit from the contributions that they make to the state um, budget. And it's really interesting that, you know, once I sort of say it that way, you know, which is something that to me, it took me, you know, maybe 15 minutes to figure out. I just went to the California, you know, uh, state controller's office and looked at the budget and sort of figured these things out. I mean, it's not rocket science. But yet, you know, people sort of don't, sort of bother to look up what the facts say and what the data say and, and, and sort of how to make decisions about it. And so in all of these conversations then, the tone changes. People sort of say, now the whole argument is that they're taking away money from citizens doesn't hold, right? And so to me, that speaks to the importance of educating the public, uh, educating politicians, because politicians oftentimes, unfortunately, repeat this rhetoric in a way that is not, again, conducive to having a productive conversation. Um, 
And so in the book, there's, there's a big emphasis on that, but there's also an, a big emphasis um, on theory building, you know, um, you know because there, you know, in, in order for academic work to be of use to this conversation, we have to do good research, right? We have to be able to do, and we have to be able to apply all of the tools at our disposal to control for biases and to control for sort of our own assumptions about issues. Um, you know, I think it's our responsibility to do that because of, especially when it comes to immigration and sort of processes related to that, because the issue, the issue is so contentious uh, and oftentimes driven so much by ideology that, you know, we can easily sort of lose, go in a direction that really is not supported by what we know, um, uh, you know, in terms of the work of the uh, scientific community. So one of the things that I highlight about, uh, you know, undocumented students in this book is the level of resilience, right? And so resilience, you know, in sort of the American sort of, uh, you know, um, uh, sort of part of the American ethos is sort of the bootstrap ideology, right? So the, the, the notion of the meritocracy. And so when we look at really stellar students, like the ones that I describe in that book that are college-bound, um, you know, it's really easy to assume, well, they're just, they're just naturally smart, right? They're just naturally brilliant, and that's why they succeed. What the findings suggest that, that maybe that's part of it, but a big part of it, too, is the social support and the environmental factors. So resilience theory allows us to identify what are sort of those environmental factors that facilitate achievement for children and young adults who grow up uh, in a context that has a variety of risk factors um, that are negatively associated with academic achievement and, you know, and, and, and higher education act access. Um, so, so part of the, the goal of the book is to contribute to that literature. Um, the other piece of the research literature that I wanted to contribute to in this book was this idea, the, 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 the experience of undocumented students as a social stigma. Um, and there's really some really fascinating work that's starting to come out about sort of just the whole identity of being undocumented, of managing an undocumented identity, right? Because it's a socially stigmatized identity. Um, young adults oftentimes don't disclose that um, to individuals because it has severe negative consequences in, if, if it's the wrong person that you disclose that to. Right, and so um, how do students go about it? And, and more importantly, from what we're seeing in the recent work of, of young activists, how do they turn it around as an identity that serves as an empowering uh, experience? Right? How do they sort of flip that so that they uh, disclose not only you know in sort of an individual basis their undocumented status, but in a public forum? Right, um, and the way that we have seen with young activists uh, in a lot of the civil disobedience activities that, have, uh, that particularly have occurred here in California, um, and this uh, notion, the slogan that is very common in, in a lot of these um, civil disobedience actions of undocumented and unafraid, right? That it it, be, it it is now going from being a socially stigmatized identity to an identity that uh, has allowed this subgroup of civically engaged young adults to become part of the political conversation and the political process um, by highlighting their undocumented identity, right? And highlighting their undocumented experience. Um, and so, you know, so there's a lot about that that tells us about social identity uh, or how to ma the management of social stigma um, that, that, I, that I think it's important because the significant trend that's coming out now and, and, and our work hopes to continue to build in this direction is the importance of providing mental health support for many young adults who don't have access to support groups that can help them manage that stigmatized identity. Um, and so, uh, most recently, uh, you know, some of you may have seen this in the newspapers. Uh, there was a young man in Texas 
who took his own life, uh, you know, high achieving, you know, he was, you know, one of the top students in his, in his school, and he lost hope. And, you know, he left a suicide letter um, where, you know, he talked about, you know, sort of just giving up because he felt that there was, you know, there was no hope for him in the future. He was an aspiring architect, um, and, you know, he had already been accepted to several universities. And, you know, uh, so that brought attention on a national level to the need to pay attention to other developmental aspects of the undocumented student experience, um, in addition to just the issue of higher education access and policy uh, discussions. Uh, my training is, uh, is as a developmental psychologist, so in addition to sort of the policy work that I've been doing, I'm also interested in the overall well-being of, of young adults and children. And this is an issue that, um, that we've been, we have started to focus on, and, and my student, uh, Richard Cortez, who is a, rec a recent PhD graduate from CGU, um, you know, has written, uh, we've written about sort of the social emotional experiences of community college undocumented students. And so, um, so really, I, the, the work is intended to um, sort of be a starting point for, for future scholars and, and other uh, immigration researchers uh, to continue to build on that um, because there's a great need for empirical work. There's a great need um, to, to inform these national debates and discussions. And I think the timing is, is particularly relevant today given, you know, sort of presidential elections coming up and the issue of immigration reform will be one of those topics that, um, particularly here in California, we're going to be interested in hearing about um, 